concrete block. So I'm kind of a science nerd. I'm one of those people that love science. I've studied biology, I studied chemistry, studied oceanography. I studied just about all of them out there, and I just love this stuff. So um, hopefully I've inspired one or two students around over the past few years and uh, gotten them to think as a scientist, think critically, not just accept opinions. Opinions need to be based on facts. There's a big disconnection out there. We're talking about connections, right? But there's a big disconnection. And that big dis disconnection that I'm going to be talking about has to do with climate change. And we're going to see, this is a, this is a giant meteor heading towards us, folks. And I think we can fix it. So I'm going to suggest that today. If you're a scientist and you're trying to get a paper published, it's not easy, folks. You're running through a gauntlet. That guy with the sword there, that's my major professor. He was, uh, you know, after me for my dissertation. And, like, they really beat you up. This is important because you can't just make something up and get it published in a scientific journal, a peer journal. It has to be really, really looked over with a fine-tooth comb. And that's, that's where I'm starting to see this disconnection. To me, this is one of the most amazing things, this, this iPhone. Connections, right? And you can get anything you want on here. Everybody knows that the Earth is round, right? The Earth is round. But you can go on here and plug in flat Earth, and you get a flat Earth society. And, you, you know, you can say just about anything you want and put it on here. Type anything you want, and you can get a whole movement going. It's just, it's pretty amazing. But you know what? You need to be critical. Opinions based on ignorance of the facts don't advance society. And we need to, we need to listen to our scientists. We really do. We need to listen to people who are spending time critically thinking about various events. About 25 years ago, and I want to talk about climate change, about 25 years ago, uh, a group of my colleagues and I, when I was working at the University of Georgia, got together, put together a grant proposal, and uh, we got a million dollars from the National Science Foundation to teach teachers about climate change. This is 1988, so not just yesterday. The idea was we'd teach multipliers. We'd teach teachers, hundreds of teachers over the summers and courses, and they'll go out and they'll teach thousands of students. Well, this was North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. Well, they all went away with all this knowledge. Of course, now there's a lot of climate deniers in all those states, so I don't know. We probably didn't go far enough. So this is what amazes me. 95%, over 95% of the scientists you talk to, legitimate scientists, agree that global warming is happening, climate change is happening, and it's because of human-induced carbon dioxide and other gases. So why is it only 44% of Americans think that humans are the cause? They don't even believe that this is happening. Head in the sand. The science is wonderful. The science comes from everywhere. This is not one guy sitting out there with his opinion. It comes from geology. You can take a look at stalactites underground, and stalactites make little rings. They make the little rings just like a tree does. And you can look at those rings, you can tell how, how old those rings are, and you can tell precisely what the temperature was at the time. So we've got evidence from there. We have evidence from coccolithophores. I love coccolithophores. Little tiny thing with a huge name. These are microscopic organisms that grow in the oceans. Oceanographers have been pulling these out in cores from the bottom of the ocean, out of the muds in the bottom of the ocean. And again, great evidence because you can look at them, see how old they were from the cores, from carbon dating and other kinds of dating. And you can also see precisely what the temperature was at the time that they were formed. Piece of evidence from the bottom of the ocean. 
There's evidence from pollen, botanists can study pollen and the distribution of pollen, it forms in layers in the bottom of lakes and in swamps and you can do a core down into that and pull it up, look at all this distribution of pollen and you can tell precisely what kind of climate existed at the time the pollen was laid down in that lake from the distribution of the plants. It's pretty elegant stuff, isn't it? Botanists study trees, tree rings. The thickness of a tree ring also can tell you pretty precisely what the climate was like at the time. And of course we have trees that are thousands of years old, so coming from another branch of science. And of course the one that we see a lot of is glaciology, the study of, of glaciers. We're now doing cores all the way down to the bottom of uh, Antarctica, Greenland. We're going back uh, almost a million years now looking at what are we looking at? We're looking at the little bubbles that are inside the core. And those little bubbles are little chunks of air that were deposited. We can tell when they were deposited, and we can tell how much carbon dioxide there was at the time, and we can tell what the temperature was at the time. Great correlations. This whole study of carbon dioxide has been going on forever. I mean, it's not new science, and our science gets better and better. It gets better and better, just like these things get better and better. It's not getting worse. The disconnect is getting worse. But carbon dioxide was, has been studied way back to Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist back in the 1800s. If you, look at the, if you look at these two things, carbon dioxide on the top and temperature on the bottom, pretty good correlation. When CO2 is up, temperature is up. And I want you to pay attention specifically to the tops here, the tops of, these are glacial periods and interglacial periods. So there's, an, there's the last interglacial period. 300, remember this number, 300 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that's the highest that we see is about 300 parts per million on all of these peaks. Right there, guess where the beach was? Macon, Georgia. You can go to Macon, Georgia, you can see the sand dunes that's where the beach was. Do we worry about sea level? Mm -hmm. One of the other elegant things is looking at radioisotopes. We're getting better and better at looking at... This is a tool for telling time, how old things are. And most people are familiar with carbon-14. It's not the only isotope, there's others, but carbon-14 is a good one. Um, we're really good at this. Carbon-14 is one of the isotopes of carbon. Carbon is mostly carbon-12. There's just a little bit of carbon-14 around. But it breaks down, and it breaks down in a very orderly ma manner so that we know precisely how old something is. So if a plant takes up some carbon, some of it's going to be carbon-14. In a fairly short period of time, it starts disappearing. And about five, every 5,000 years, half of it is gone. So we can tell exactly how old something is. And we're getting better at that. And there's a lot of other isotopes that we also use. The other one is, that I lo love is, is oxygen isotopes. And oxygen isotope analysis is, is an important part of looking at temperature. Because oxygen isotopes come in two sizes. Well, there's more than two. But these are the important ones. Oxygen-16 is the normal isotope of oxygen. Okay. Oxygen-18 is a little chunky, kind of like I am, right? It doesn't move quite as fast as it did when it was 16. And uh, <laughs> so, so the oxygen-18 needs a little energy to get it moving. So knowing this, we can have a very precise thermometer that we make looking at the ratio of that lazy oxygen-18 to the amount of oxygen-16. And we can, we can make a very precise thermometer. And this, this stuff is getting better and better. And you can see, you know, with a little heat, boom, there it goes. See, we get all excited. The, heav the heavyweights get more excited, right? So, what's happening? Um, is it getting warmer? You, you look at these things and the problem is that things get warmer and colder, warmer and colder. But watch, watch this little quick video here cooler, warmer. Now watch the last 20 years.
And I think what's really important is to look up here. Because there's Greenland, and Greenland contains about 21 feet worth of water. And that's where most of the heating is, is happening, is in the northern hemisphere, um, a whole number of things happening there. So if we melt all the ice, hmm, should we be concerned about this? Should we worry about money? Um, how much is it going to cost? How much is Miami Beach worth? How much is Miami, Fort Lauderdale, New York, Los Angeles, how much are these places worth to us? Yeah, it's going to cost a little money. But here it is. Remember I said, remember the number 300? Here's where we are now. We're up around, we're up, whoops, I'm sorry. We're up around 400 parts per million, higher than we've ever seen. We don't have any idea what effect that's going to have in the long run. I don't think we have the political will. I don't think we have it in our economy to be able to switch away from burning fossil fuels this century. We're just too tied into it. So what are we going to do? We're just going to let things happen? If we saw a meteor, if scientists saw a meteor that was going to cause a huge amount of damage to the Earth about 10 years out there, would we just ignore it? I don't think so. I think we'd get every engineer, every scientist in the world to solve this problem. You know, we got to divert that thing, get it away from our track. I think we're looking at this kind of problem with global warming. So we can engineer, we can engineer CO2 out of the atmosphere. We can scrub it out of the atmosphere. We have machines that can already do it. But it's got to be done in a big way. It's got to be done like, you know, an interstate system or my landing on the moon. We can do it. We can do it. It'll cost some money. So I have a concrete cure. Oh, concrete. There's an awful lot of this uh, carbon dioxide that's dissolving in water and it's forming carbonic acid. It's also acidifying the oceans. This may be more worrisome than um, the whole global warming thing anyway. But you know what? We can precipitate calcium carbonate out of the water by adding a little calcium hydroxide, or maybe a lot. You put it in this system and drip, 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 put a little calcium hydroxide in there, a little more calcium hydroxide in there, and magic. You take pollution out of the air and out of the water, and boom, you make some concrete blocks, and then you can build stuff, positive stuff with that, or maybe you can stand on it and get away from sea level rise. Or, <laughs> or one more thing, it's the, this is calcium carbonate, okay? It's the same stuff you make Tums with. Maybe we make a lot of Tums, and everybody will stop worrying about all this stuff anyway. anyway thank you very much. <laughs>